Good morning, good morning. Derek Watson here, the angry dentist. Thursday, 16th of March. Oh, people will run out of petrol. That's all I need, I've run out of petrol. Then you find that life is sort of increasingly just dealing with a series of minor frustrations. I need a, an oil filter. And the oil filter I need is a sort of a non-standard filter and so I can't get anyone to, I can't find it, I can't source it on the internet. I've rung up my local car spares place which is normally very good and has got everything. And um, they're just like, oh yeah, well uh, we'll probably get one of those in for you, you know, we'll give you a ring on Monday. So where are we now, Wednesday? Still no, no, they've, they've forgotten it haven't they? They've just forgotten it. Put it on a piece of paper and thrown it away. This is why in the service sector you can do so well if you just provide the effing service that you're being contracted to provide. You know, there's no uh, there's no mystery about being successful. You just have to tell people what you can do and do it. Sorry, I've got a headache. I shouldn't shout. And then uh, I've got a rotavator, so I rotavate about two square yards of soil and the, and the cam belt's broken on it. So I've got to find another cam belt for that and, it, and of course it's a rare cam belt of a particular width and length that you can only get, you know, from some Chinese factory if you ordered a thousand of them and wait up to two months for delivery. So it looks like I'm going to become the premier UK importer of this particular cam belt. <clears throat> if anyone uh, We'll have to try and find other uses for them. And then, this headache. I was looking for some aspirin, because I like to keep things simple. I don't like, uh, you know, aspirin is the most I probably would ever take for a headache, and I haven't taken one for years. And I've had a headache plenty of times and not taken anything. And, you know, by mid-morning it sort of worked its way off. But Today I've got like four molar root treatments booked in, so I said to my wife, I've got to have an aspirin, because I'm not going to be doing molar root treatments with a banging headache. So uh, so we found a couple, but they were the last two, so we decided to order some more. She says to me, I'll stick some on my shopping list. So she said, oh, uh, Alexa, put aspirin on the shopping list. So. Oh, Alexa, bless her heart, she's, she's dumb as anything. She says, okay, I put Afrin on the shopping list and I turned to Bridie and I said, what, what, the, uh, what is Afrin, what is Afrin? She said, I don't know, but she said, this is like, this is a woman's way of thinking, right? She's like, I'll know when, when I go to Tesco's and look down my shopping list and it'll say Afrin and I'll know Aspirin. See? She's happy. <laughs> but who's not happy? Old angry here. I said, uh, I'm not having that. These computers, they're so dumb. They keep going on about artificial intelligence and voice recognition and I'll tell you that there's nothing... You, <laughs> When you can actually hold a conversation with your phone or when you know you can they can literally make some sense out of what you're saying and I'm not I mean actually the audio quality on this phone is quite good I think it is doing some sort of intelligent filtering on my voice because uh, listening to the sort of the last few podcasts it's the voice is actually extremely clear especially considering some of the terrible microphones that they had in um, in the early Android phones, they really didn't, you know, bother about sound at all. Unlike the iPhones, the iPhones always had really, really good sort of almost like broadcast quality microphones um, because they were sort of being bought by arty types and uh, you know audio audio files. And uh, a lot of the early DFO bro uh, podcasts were re just recorded on an iPhone when I had an iPhone. Uh, and the microphone now on the Androids is pretty good and I think they're doing some signal processing which is excellent because you tend to be able to hear for the most part my voice and not the 
the car, although the car to me is quite noisy. Anyway, getting off the topic, so so I'm like, I'm not going to let Alexa get away with that, you know. I'm, she's not, <laughs> she's not any of that monkey business with me, right? If I want aspirin, I shall have aspirin. So I said, Alexa, put aspirin on the shopping list. She says, okay. <laughs> she says, I put our spring on the on the shopping list and I'm like what's our spring <laughs> it's like when you know when you autocorrect on a phone and you type like a perfectly normal word which any human would know was the next word that you meant to say like <laughs> you're sincerely or something and then it autocorrects sincerely to sacroiliac and you know, or even some word that you've never heard of, you know, some some brand new word. Then you think, is that a word really? I've never even read that, you know. And this, and it's put so it's put offspring on the, and I don't even know what an offspring is. What is an offspring? How does how does she come up with offspring? I mean, I know it sounds superficially similar to aspirin, but it doesn't. I mean, I made a point of enunciating it correctly. I said aspirin. Unless it's the English accent, they just don't, she doesn't understand, you know, and she's expecting me to say aspirin, aspirin, or something. Or perhaps our spring is the American for aspirin. <laughs> Can you, I mean, what, words fail me. Just provide the service that, that I want you to, you know, just that all I'm asking is that you just recognize, do recognize what I'm saying, which is what you say on the box you're supposed to do. And it's not like aspirin is a difficult word. I mean, really, it's actually quite a... I don't think it sounds like anything else. Can you, I mean, what are they doing when they were programming Alexa? Said, oh, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, oh, now, who's in charge of the springs? We're putting all the springs in. OK, yes, yeah, it's you, is it, John? Right, John, right. Well, don't forget, we've got coach springs, car springs, uh, you know, pen springs, bed springs, and don't forget the arse spring. You what? Yeah, the offspring. Make sure that Alexa knows about offsprings. Someone might order one one day. Oh. Anyway, what I was going <laughs> to what I was going to talk about today was was uh, my ideal dental service. I don't think I'll have much time to do it. I might, we might have to continue this tomorrow. But, you know, I, I like to be sort of positive. You know me, old angry, likes to be positive about everything. So, <laughs> so, so I thought, well, you know, I'm always complaining about everything. And so, and you know, it's only fair that you should say, you know, if you ruled the world, how you would do it, how you would do it differently. Differently and better, that's the key, doing something differently and better. So, <clears throat> But um, the problem with sort of debating how to provide dentistry is, is very much, um, there's a few sort of basic principles that you need to get under your belt first. And uh, when we were, I mean, like for example, I've given evidence to the House of Commons Health Select Committee a couple of times. Oh, and you get plenty of advice on what to say. And so, and you know, and obviously you are doing a lot of talking about policy or what the Americans call a policy wonk talking about dental policy all the time oh you know we're, and nothing people say oh <clears throat> they, they, they're sort of debating with you and, and thinking that you're going to get bored with it and you're not because you, I could talk dental policy all day but there are a few questions if, if you and I ever have a chat about dental policy I'll ask you a couple of questions and they are a little bit loaded because if you get the answers wrong then the discussion really won't go much further and one of them is um, <clears throat> the the decision about whether or not, you know, whether you should provide a, a small amount of dentistry for everybody or a pretty comprehensive service for just a few. Because that's your choice. You really can't provide as much dentistry as everybody wants within a limited budget. Your, and your budget is always going to be a certain size. You know, you can't just, well, I mean, <laughs> actually at the moment they've proved that you can print money and spend it on what you like but let's assume for the sake of this thought experiment that the budget is fixed and you've got a choice between uh, spreading the um, the budget thinly over a few people or um, 
or you know, or saying to everyone, yeah, you can have implants, you can have crowns, gold crowns, whatever. Okay, um, pause the video <laughs> and decide which one you think. Okay, did you pause the video? You idiot. <laughs> what did you pause the video for? What is, this is not, a, you know, I mean, this is not a difficult decision really, which is why it's sort of dentistry policy 101. The answer is, <clears throat> hang on, let me turn left. Oh, this is a bit suspenseful, isn't it? I'm going to turn left and say what the answer is. The answer is that you have to spread the dentistry very thin. You have to uh, tell everyone that they are, they're entitled. But in practice, obviously some people are going to need more than others, aren't they? So what you do is you try and get everybody out of your system as fast as you can. <clears throat> Excuse me. So why do you have to spread it thin? Well, the answer to that is that everybody pays either pays national insurance or is liable to pay national insurance if they earn enough. So, hang on a second. So, yeah, so you have to spread it thin because everybody's entitled to, nation, to, to pay national insurance. And so what you can't do is you can't say to people that you, you are have to pay national insurance, but you're not going to be entitled to any of the benefits. Personally, I think you probably could say that because you could say it's a sort of the there but for the grace of God argument, isn't it? So saying, you know, this we are going to provide a safety net level of benefit which you would be entitled to access should you ever get to the point where, you know, to the point where you're so unfortunate that you need to, uh, you know, use um, state-provided housing or state-provided food or whatever. But you, at the moment you don't need it, So, but we do expect you to contribute to it because you would be entitled to use it if you ever you know, got to that point. But that's not actually the compact that the, uh, that the health service made with people in 1948. They, they didn't say, we're going to set up a universal health service that will only cater for you when you're sleeping rough. They said, no, this is, this is for everybody. That was their big promise. And in a way that was their big mistake because um, everybody was like, and, and we've all had patients like this, you know, come in, I pay my national insurance, I don't see why I shouldn't have implants on the health service, etc, etc. So, so what happens is that you've got this, you've got this service that's spread absurdly thin and, um, and you're trying to maintain an illusion that it provides uh, everything for everybody, yeah? So, but what you're doing at the underneath the surface, behind the scenes, you're sort of pedalling as fast as you can to try and make sure that people get as little as possible and as few people get uh, are entitled to treatment without explicitly saying um, uh, that uh, you know that anyone is is literally barred. And so that's why you, you've got a tension within the National Health Service insofar as the, um, the Department of Health is sort of purveying this, this sort of nirvana, you know, you know how on the TV, right, if anything is going really, really badly wrong, right, if anything is, is, is a complete mess and they don't want the government, uh, you know, sort of, how can I put it? Take the series Doctors, right? Doctors is, uh, or I was, I don't know if it's still on, but it was a series that was on sort of lunchtime on two or three times a week, I don't know. And it was set in a, in a general practice and it was all about um, uh, a general, general practitioner, a, a general practitioner's surgery. And it, it bore absolutely no resemblance whatsoever to... Um, an actual surgery in that the things that happened in it you know were um, always worked out well in the sort of the in the sort of tradition of happy endings you know there was I'm not saying nobody ever got sick <laughs> but you know there was always there was always enough funding and enough and there were you know and they were all sort of quite good-looking intelligent people and uh, 
you know, and the Americans do the same, don't they? They've got their, their ER, they've got George Clooney working in ER, and then we have, uh, we have, uh, you know, while the race riots are going on all over the place, we've got the bill showing, uh, old, what's his name, with the big nose, <laughs> but the lovely policeman, you know, where the worst thing that goes wrong in the police station is that someone spills a, copy, a cup of coffee over the, um, the keyboard. On the, on the on the desk sergeant's computer, and we're all sitting thinking, oh, everything's <laughs> everything's all right with the world, you know. <laughs> and uh, I think, and and the Department of Health are the same, you know. They're trying to purvey that same sort of, yeah, well, everything's fine. Everyone's getting everything. Everyone gets everything in the end, you know. It's all there's there's happy endings. We've got a little. Um, and when I was in the doctor's surgery the other day, there's a poster on the wall from East Kent community health trust or something saying you know uh, we are um, we are accepting NHS patients accepting NHS patients now it says and and I thought oh, really that's amazing <laughs> that's great you know? because no I only yesterday I um, needed to refer a patient to uh, an NHS dentist I mean we, we actually do it quite a bit in fact when we went private originally in Whitstable um, I used to go down the postgraduate centre and uh, the dentist used to say to me, oh, I hear you've gone private, have you? Yeah, I say, I say yeah, I have, yeah. And they would be like, oh, okay. And, and then of course in their mind, the reason why I'd gone, the, the reason why my patients had gone private in their mind was because I'd just given them an ultimatum. I just said to my patients, look, I'm your dentist, I'm going private, therefore you can, you can go private or uh, you know, it's my way or the highway sort of thing. Well, th th it was never like that, and th they never understood that. It, the reason my patients went private was because they wanted more time, better quality materials, better quality laboratory work. Not, not because they had no choice. They had plenty of choice. Uh, and in fact, I even helped them if they said, you know, look, and some of them did. They said, I'm sorry, Derek, I can't afford this. You know, I'm going to have to make other arrangements. And I said, right, in that case, I'm going to bust the gut to get you into the best National Health Service practice in the area. And used to write referral letters and things to, so they didn't have to go on waiting lists. But anyway, the, the um, <clears throat> yeah, so these dentists, they were like, oh, well, Oh, I think I might just set up a branch practice next to you then, you know, on the National Health Service and nick all your patients. <clears throat> and I'm like, oh God, you know, I wish you would. And they were like, what? I say, yeah, yeah, would you please, honestly, if you could just come up and sit up right next to me, right next door on the National Health Service, that would be so useful. Because what I could do is then I could keep all the patients who wanted more time, more better quality materials and better quality laboratory work, and I could give you all the patients who are temporarily sort of down on their luck, who had no choice but to get stuff done on the health service. And they were like, <clears throat> oh, okay then. And this poster in the, in the uh, doctors saying, don't you worry, NHS treatment available everywhere. It's not, it, the point is not that <clears throat> patients can actually get treatment from these places because they're, they're, they've got two surgeries, right? <laughs> For the whole of East Kent, they've got two surgeries. So I don't know, I mean, I've a good mind, because I'm a bit cheeky, to ring them up and test the veracity of their claim that they're taking. And they boast about, oh, high quality. This is high quality. They actually say high quality, you know, NHS dental work. And uh, <clears throat> I've a good mind to ring up and just uh, check and see whether they are uh, still accepting patients, because I don't, for a minute, think that they're going to be able to carry on doing that for very long. But, but the main thing is it sort of, I don't know, every patient who's sitting in there, they probably won't want to ring the NHS Dental Service, but they'll be sitting there and there'll be a lovely little poster on the wall saying, but don't worry, everything's fine, you know, you know, you may be standing up, you'll be sitting on a springy park bench or something, but if you wanted an NHS dentist, we could get you one, just don't ever ask, you know. Anyway, perhaps I'll, I'll continue with the theme of how to fix the, uh, the NHS or the, or the dental services uh, tomorrow. You have a nice day. If you're doing a root treatment, think of me because I'll be thinking of you. All right, bye.